I think most of you, some of you, may even have used a map to get here. <laughs> we have street maps and road maps, hiking trail maps, bus maps, underground maps, railway maps, aeronautical maps, nautical maps, weather maps, mining maps, ski maps, park maps. We have celestial maps, star maps, maps to stars homes, political maps, topographical maps, economic maps, population maps, vegetation maps, soil maps, flood zone maps, redlining mortgage loan maps, school district maps, museum maps. Maps have been drawn to mark where we are, what lies ahead of us, to note the paths that we've taken so that others may follow or that we may return. We mark these paths to understand what is present, what is important, and in what relationship things exist. Maps anchor us to a home base and they give us the freedom to explore expanded vistas. The artists in Mapping the Uncharted use physical maps as a point of departure for reconfiguring impressions of geography, politics, and visual language. This is a charting of culture, the art market, music, and cyberspace. It makes visible that which is often intangible, that which leads beyond the known. We're so pleased to be able to welcome today our artists, Lordi Rodriguez, Indira Martina Moray, Diane Rosenblum, and Mark Garrett. Please welcome them all with us. So I would like to start first with a question, um, really, that I'd like, I hope that each of you could address for us. And that is just um, to talk a little bit about your beginnings and what drew you to um, this kind of mark making, mapping, cataloging, Rec record, you know, records and and um, a, you know, giving a physical a physical graphic form to things that are conceptualized normally. And maybe you could just start with your, you know, what drew you and attracted you. For me, I started working with um, cartography and mapping when I was in college, and it came from a sense of homesickness. I used to drive back and forth between Texas and New York between every semester. And so the only way I could relate to the land was constantly looking at the map. Um, the thing is, is that when I was in college, I was so focused on how I was making the work I was making, you know, whether I was learning painting or drawing. Um, but I started to become more concerned about um, what I'm trying to say with my work, how I'm saying it. Um, and mapping was a very great language to be able to uh, play around with that, since uh, the list that you gave out earlier really, I think, um, shows us that the amount of content that a map can have is wide and varied. So it really depends on the cartographer or the artist to figure out what you want to say. Um, and often, that's, that, for me, um, that's where it started. Hi, and welcome. Nice to see you here. Um, so. The question that started um, the conversation that I'm hoping to have with my work is how is our um, presence now in, 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 in this kind of time different than let's say 50 years ago, 100 years ago? And one thing that I noticed, you know, especially you know, with myself and my son that's 20 years old, it's how um, is our relationship to technology is changing our own presence, our own being. And for me, maps are something um, sort of invisible. The, the maps that I'm trying to create, that, tr that I'm trying to make it present is something that we're not so much aware. Like for example, the passwords that I have this piece over there, they're at the threshold of the three-dimensional mapping, such as you know, being present in three-dimensional space and our, um, our transition into the two-dimensional space. Very different kind of mapping that we're looking at. And, and the passwords itself is, is sort of this threshold that we're going through, that we're um, um, 
transcending these, uh, these kind of dualities of being. So I also have um, signs that, um, signs for example, if you use the Apple computer, you'll notice that um, all of these signs are actually from the Apple computer. So how do we map that kind of presence? So that's, where it, that, that's actually where it started. H how are we different? How is our consciousness, our, our presence in time different? And, and that, that's sort of the question that I'm still fascinating with. All right, the mapping that I'm doing is of economic data, of uh, the markets of various artists. And as dry as that material might be, I actually come to it from a very psychological and personal place. Um, and it comes with, from growing up in the family that I grew up in and having to map out my own identity in that family. So my mother is a financial analyst. And so I grew up, um, with this model of markets, and um, every afternoon I'd check the Dow Jones average on the radio <laughs> to find out what kind of mood she'd be in when she came home. Very well correlated, it's interesting. Okay, so, you know, I had this very, always had an incredibly strong interest in art, and um, everyone else in the family was looking at statistics and markets and data and science and, and all of these kinds of things. And so about 12 years ago, 15 years ago, I wanted to figure out how to bring this into my artwork. And I started by looking at, well, I first started from this kind of contrary point of view of looking at um, the, the rogues of the economic world, of looking at Michael Milken and making portraits of people like that, and it really didn't work out. Okay, they're, they're quite horrid people, and I didn't want to glorify them. And so then I went into this other kind of sense of, all right, I'll look at the history of the stock market and see what I can come to. And it was a slow process of about six months to a year of trying to figure out where to go here with these ranging thoughts about how to incorporate business information into artwork. And actually, it's with a piece over there, the Agnes Martin piece, was the first one where it really came together, where I realized that I'm, I'm interested in art, I'm not interested that much in business, although I've become more so through this project, ironically. Um, and I began to put that all together. So that's some of how I came to it. Hi. Um, let's see. I, I would say that maps as a medium uh, were fairly accidental for me. They really uh, kind of, uh, were, I was looking for a collage material that kind of spoke to me and um, <clears throat> having uh, always been pretty much um, surrounded by globes and maps and things of all variety growing up, I, I, was, uh, I was aware of a large variety of different forms of maps, but I, inevitably they, they, I came, I realized that it was, it was this language that was it was unique. It's a unique material for me because it bridges kind of this art and literature world. It sort of it brought for me. It, it was like, oh, this is like infor like real time data kind of information combined with beautiful visual. You know, and it was like a beautiful marriage for me. So, I I think that taking that as as a starting point and then. Um, using it as a, as a place to sort of create movement and create a, a kind of flow. And uh, there's a lot of, uh, Diane and I were talking earlier about how um, we have multiple series of works and work in different veins, and this just happens to be one of them. And, uh, but there is a thread that goes through my work, and one of those threads is this kind of, kind of fluidity of, of natural motion. And um, I am very much interested in that uh, as it relates to us as human beings. And, and uh, I, uh, I don't, I'd never really intended to make a political statement about my work, but um, both with climate, with climate change and with uh, the latest political uh, shenanigans in Washington, it's just been like, um, I've been getting so much attention around this work. 
particularly because so a recent piece is of the, uh, I call it, it's a series called States of Decay, and it, it's the United States that are literally melting away at the bottom. And, um, so it, I kind of, uh, Jan's helped me embrace the, uh, the way uh, uh, people can sort of bring their own interpretation to the work, and I really appreciate that because, uh, you know, it, it, it helps me um, think in a larger way about what I'm doing. And, and as is often the case, I find maybe you guys too, you never really know exactly what you're doing or understand the complexity of what you're doing until you're done or it's on the wall in a show or, it's, or people start talking to you about it or you get feedback, you know, it's just like, oh, that's what that's about. Yeah. What, what, maybe you wanna hold, do you wanna address that? Or? Um, I, I, I would like it if, um, I, I think it would be great if you could in turn um, just focus on one of your pieces and discuss the whole process and development and evolution of one of your works and how um, you know, you, the image evolves for you. Uh, well, let's see. I, I have a technique I call drawing with scissors and I literally um, uh, take scissors and I used a, I, I started by folding maps, usually from the back side, because I didn't want to see where I was, what I was, what was happening, and I wanted to be surprised, like you used to be when you've cut up paper and made snowflakes and stuff. Uh, and so that's how that initially evolved. And then I started flipping them over and just following various contours, but not getting too married to the lines in the image. And and uh, then I would fold in different directions and cut and keep getting like in the the point raise piece, the square piece on the, uh, the bigger piece on the wall over there. It, it was about folding as I went along and cutting and getting, creating a mirror image in a, in a, in a graceful sort of swirling way. And um, from there, you know, it was, to me it's been, it's all been a very organic kind of accidental process because I was just, with the evolution of these two large pieces on this wall, um, they were really uh, a byproduct of that same process of point race, but um, taking this idea of um, the black globes that you may have grown up with, I grew up with, with the black oceans. I don't know if you've seen those. And using that as a, as a point of like more dramatic departure. Um, but the, also I wanted to create a sense of layering and, and depth and I love works that in, in a two-dimensional way can still have um, a kind of transition to another layer and I like seeing shadows and work and texture and that sort of thing. So I don't know if that answers the question so well, but that's sort yeah. of the process. All right, so what I'm doing in, my, in these pieces is taking uh, the artist's sales data from auctions and then graphing it in their own visual language. So the one up here, the red one, is based on the data of Yayoi Kusama. In this case, I largely appropriated um, the red spots there, the red circles, are directly from a Yayo Yayoi Kusama print. Um, some of my work, it's much more close to appropriation and other times I'm creating, like this one I'm creating in that artist's visual language. That's something Gene Davis might have done, but he did, he did not do a piece like that, but it's his stripes and his colors. So this one, um, it's Yayoi Kusama's sales data. And uh, I started, I'm not sure what year I started there, maybe 89, I think that one's 89 to 2005. The, um, her data is represented in the orange dots, and they scale up with price, and they go from um, left to right. Time goes from left to right, so year by year. And if you look closely at the piece, the years are written there in white, and the prices are written uh, as you go up. Uh, so I made this actually by, um, in the computer, redrawing in Adobe Illustrator, Kusama's piece, and then printing it on canvas, like that. 
Um, so for me, before I even start making any marks, I have to prepare my surfaces and usually I work on panel and then either linen or canvas and then I apply multiple layers of gesso that I have to sand in between. And I do that for a reason because I work with graphite and mainly ink. So I want my surfaces to be very smooth so the, the, the graphite marks are clear. Um, and then I sometimes I play, uh, apply um, a layer of graphite and then I um, then cover it with a layer of gesso, a very thin layer of gesso, and then I build, um, build, build that as well. Um, in terms of my visual vocabulary, sometimes I do have like the systems, although you know uh, the uh, the viewer might not be able to decipher it. So, for example, for um, human algorithm, which is that piece over there, uh, there's a very simple um, kind of algorithm that goes. I'm just making these up and down marks. This is how this piece comes up and down, up and down, up and down, and it's sort of like I'm I'm weaving the things together. I have no idea how it's going to end, but I'm using my kind of uh, spontaneity in in mark making to um, to make the piece by itself, and that of course kind of mimics the. Um, um, or perhaps it, with some kind of absurd way mimics the technology because we know how technology operates. It's all between this, this zero and one thing. It's very simple. So, so in a way, like the, 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 the very limited movements, the very limited kind of visual vocabulary, it's very important for me. And yet sort of like being in space, being in three-dimensional space, being aware of my own breathing, being aware of my own repetitive movements, you know, it's important um, to sort of, uh, to sort of perhaps um, celebrate, celebrate my existence this way and, and to, um, to understand the technology that we already have in our own, with our own bodies, with our own consciousness. Thank you. <clears throat> um, well, all, a lot of my, all my work is, um, all, my, all my work before, I'm, I'm <laughs> I'm, I'm thinking about what I'm working on right now too, but um, majority of my work are are um, hand drawn on paper, so there's an intimacy there, um, and, and I'm just using regular old graphic markers. Um, so there's nothing special about the medium that I'm using, but there's an intimacy there with the work that I'm trying to parallel to um, older cartographers before the I guess the printed age, or. Uh, before computers or uh, printing uh, printed uh, uh, maps, so when surveyors would go out and map the land, they would just hand draw and everything, and whatever they didn't um, get to see or couldn't um, figure out, they would just make up the rest. So there was this always this um, strange flippancy with the truth when it came to mapping, and, and we all kind of understood it or or um, ag agreed that 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 there would be that uh, little bit of discontinuity there. So um, there's, um, there, there's this element that I'm trying to emulate um, by hand drawing them, even though the ironic part is that they kind of look printed in the end. Um, now, maybe, maybe I'll talk about that. <laughs> this is maybe way too specific, but I'm gonna talk about the top one over there. Because um, what I'm gonna talk about with that can be related to all the other drawings of my work that you see in the show. Um, uh, these small 10 by 14 drawings are part of a much more larger series. Um, right now, there are around 500 of these small drawings. And what it was, it initially started off as a way to itemize my visual voc vocabulary um, one by one. Um, and it was a, always important from the beginning of this work that I'm doing is that I'm not appropriating a map. Um, I'm appropriating the visual language of mapping. So that means that the content can be anything I want, um, even though the language is somewhat recognizable. Now, um, by, by relegating my relationship to this as a language, um, itemizing them into a vocabulary made sense at the time. But um, after a while, uh, when I first started off, I topped out at 70, 75 drawings. I, uh, this is a short series. <laughs> so I, it became a platform to expand on this vocabulary, to, um, to push and try out different um, aesthetics that that bring us back to the map. 
Um, so with that one, the, this little herringbone pattern, um, and especially this um, alternating between a light green, a dark green, and then that fluorescent orange in between, it pushes your eye away from the drawing. Uh, whereas most maps are supposed to be inviting and um, at least in terms of the information that it's trying to portray, understandable. And um, with that and a lot, and even um, to some degree the one on the bottom, there's always this, well, this goal of pushing that recognition of, of whether or not this is a map. Because in reality, they're all, none of my work are maps because the, the basic content that makes a map a map, it, it doesn't belong there. Um, the intention are purely artistic. Um, so from the beginning, it's not a map, but obviously there's this connection to this language. And so trying to find that connection between um, the map or to the art has always been an interesting point of departure, with, um, especially with these smaller drawings. And you could see it um, maybe with, um, with these and the, the ones in the, uh, in the one piece in the front where, or actually maybe, yeah, especially these two they could easily be an abstract image. And yet, there's something that pulls us towards the map. Um, and I've always found um, mapping, um, I, I think, in, in, in my opinion, maps is probably the very first visual language. And um, you know, we could see many different examples of using mapping and cartography in this room. And, and there are uh, a multitude of artists out there that are working with um, cartography and maps. Um, and um, if mapping is a language, the different kinds of maps that we're working with, I would re relate it to as dialects. Um, and so if we keep on making this comparison to language, then what would the very first maps would look like? Well, if I would imagine, um, uh, this is very rudimentary, I'm gonna describe it as like cavemen trying to describe to another caveman where a good fishing spot would be, they would just draw on the, the ground or on the cave and, or wherever, um, just to say, this circle is lake, go towards that circle, you'll find fish. It's a very basic um, uh, foundational language that has been built on and on and on. So with that premise, I'm a, it's a huge assumption um, that visual language, um, the mapping as a visual language, um, if there was no verbal language um, to, to start off with, you could still re relay information in that fashion. And that in itself was quite interesting. Um, and so as I continue um, with these smaller drawings, that connection to the visual language is something that um, I'm, I'm continually, continuing um, trying to either break apart or find the connection. Um, so one of the things that I find very interesting um, in all this work, which is going off into many different directions, but yet um, for the most part does retain some very um, traditional language of mapping. For instance, the grid and um, having a horizontal and a vertical for orientation. So maybe you could just talk about what that structure brings to your work, what it affords you, why you retain certain aspects of the language and why you, you know, how and where you separate off and go in other directions. Um, do you want to start this time, Indira? Sure. <laughs> I, <can get> started. <laughs> I, I think I have two pieces with the grid, or three. I have yeah. three pieces yeah. with, the, you know, the, the, with the actual grid. And um, one piece in the middle that I talked about, it's, it's their passwords and this kind of grid um, was, um, en enabled me to actually go and be very precise where these, where these um, dots um, will be. And I wanted to, I was really interested in, in creating this overwhelming sense of, um, these passwords that perhaps offer a false sense of security for us. You know, we, we use them. We use them a lot, and we, you know, we don't always think about them as we as we utilize them, and and that kind of um, relates to the pieces that are flanking the the passwords too, where I use the signs, where these utilitarian signs, you know, that we continuously use in our computers are actually here stripped of that utilitarian um, function 
And in fact, they are sort of visual representation of the world that almost forms itself by itself. And, and the grid, um, it, for me, it creates that kind of repetition, that kind of order, that kind of, um, um, I would say, a, a visual, um, um, visual representation of um, continuity as well, because the grid, we can imagine that that continues for, you know, an infinity. Um, but also, I make my own grids, um, like in networks and some kind of what I call the human algorithms. I make my own grids because I think it's important to break away from the geometric um, horizontal vertical kind of um, vocabulary. And then I um, make uh, the, the laws, the, the, my own laws that I, that I apply to them in order for, for me to understand how certain areas or certain kind of um, local um, laws are affecting the global laws. So um, when you look at the piece, like for example, very, very um, left piece over there, you might just see, oh, well, that's, that's those nodes, you know, that diff differ in a certain way. But I, I thought about them. I, I really kind of um, um, make, made, uh, made a decisions where they're going to be according to some kind of internal logic that, that I had at the time. Okay. Well, if you look at my work in the entryway, which is based on uh, Agnes Martin, it's in the form of a grid. <coughs> and that grid I picked up from Agnes Martin. What's interesting about her, because on the one hand, you think about gr grids in terms of mathematics, and they're very important, of course, in the presentation of data and uh, visualization of data. But what's so interesting to me about Agnes Martin, in part, is that there's a paradoxical sense in which, to her, the grid uh, and her work in itself she said was the route to happiness. Um. <laughs> I, I like that. Yeah. <clears throat> um, gosh, would you mind repeating the question for me? My, my I just want to, I, I, yeah, I we, can, we can alter the question, but what I was interested in is um, what aspects of actual, um, of, of map making, of, of how maps are set up, mm -hmm. be they the grid, um, a vertical, a horizontal, in some cases a legend, like mm -hmm. you've, you know, taking a legend, having a legend. What, what is important to you? What does it afford you when you use the system? Mm -hmm. What do yeah. you leave behind and why? What kinds of decisions are you making about what you take from this language? Yeah, um, yeah. in my experience, I, well, I started working with this, uh, with, with these, uh, when I first started working with maps in my artwork, I was cutting out the center of them and just using the material, the raw material in the middle without any relationship to the, the boundaries or the, corner, the edges of the paper or anything like that. <coughs> um, it was later in the work that I started just sort of exploding the actual map with the borders a little bit <laughs> and, and including the border and kind of defining the um, but I go back and forth, and, and the, uh, I don't know that, the, that it really, uh, they have different statements. They make different statements for me, and um, the work has, seems to have been appealing for different reasons for that, you know, some with the border, some without. But essentially, um, I've, I've never felt especially dependent on the grid unless it was something that I thought was specifically defining a piece. Um, but more recently, with the, the little bitty black one, uh, it, it is closer to what I'm, how I'm working now, which is, is more um, without a border, without a, a clear definition of, of a, 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 the idea of something vaguely familiar to us, but could be floating in space, you know, or, and somewhere else. Um, uh, maybe, um, I, I really like your question a lot because 
Um, the elements that we as artists decide to choose um, or decide to um, use in from cartography and mapping kind of dictates what we're doing with it. Um, and for me, the grid and you see that little blue border that goes around the, the map? That, those are two elements that I use all the time in my work. Um, and practically speaking for a map, the grid and that little border is a way for you to find things in the map. So it's like a map for the map. So that in itself was quite interesting. If you notice though, none of those blue bars line up. I mean, from the beginning, I've, um, I've been working with this, um, this kind of language for since 96. So quite a while, and, and they, I've never made them line up. Um, and that goes back to this, um, this map as a utility of um, truth in a way, or consensual truth. Um, you know, it, it, we look at the America map that I have outside, there's nothing visually accurate about it, but the content, um, there is still a truth to that content that's being played with. But it's not exactly the same kind of truth that we're expecting from a map. So, um, you know, by playing with that, that's something that fundamentally aligns with my initial um, uh, reason for playing with maps. Also, there's a really interesting, especially with these two, since um, I've been using the, this kind of topographical language for quite a while, um, sort of, I mean, I, I don't use it right now, but um, there was a good period where I was using that a lot. And I thought it was interesting to have these layers of colors and lines that dictate depth for us. Either whether or not it's blue that signifies going down or this mountainous that signifies going up. And yet the visual effect grids have is to flatten the picture plane. So you have two things, two paradoxical elements happening where you have flat lines and color that are meant to represent depth and then on top of that is a grid that flattens everything down. Um, so it's a strange um, combination of visuals. In, in perhaps the same way the optics change or the optical response to the top and the bottom of those, uh, those three pieces um, affect the way that we look at it. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm really glad that you wanted to talk about the Agnes Martin piece because if um, there were always two major influences in my work both visually and conceptually, and one of them is Agnes Martin for that particular reason of the grid flattening out the picture plane. And then um, on top of that would be um, Takashi Murakami, who is very poppy and bright, and yet he's the master of the super flat. So there's this really funny combination uh, between these two artists that I find myself somewhere in the middle, or at least a child of. You know, what's really interesting here is you're talking about this. Takashi Murakami is also one of my major um, influences. And even though our work looks not very much alike, I think there's a lot of common basis. You're talking about these drawings here and going through a series of images and vocabulary and so on. And I do, I've done the same thing repeatedly. I'm working on it now with a series of drawings. It's really interesting how these underlying connections happen. Murakami and Agnes Martin. I wonder yeah. how many more others are artists are there <laughs> influenced by these. Okay, Agnes Martin what? for sure here. Okay, <laughs> well let's do, let's just let's just go with this. Why don't you talk about a couple of people who have been influential for you and whose work you have um, you know have has people whose work has occupied your thought and consideration. Um, outside, um, including artists or outside, or does it matter? Oh, let's go beyond the art. Beyond the, beyond the, the art, scope. beyond, you know. I think, I think that's a great question, but I think the question is even a bit bigger if you say, why, why, why? did this particular artist hit you big? No. Or open something for right. you? Good. you know, because that is what happens to artists, I feel. Right, I, I think, I, actually, that, that's really good because it's a way to contextualize why these two are important um, in, in, for me and my work. Um, Agnes Martin, for one, I, 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 again, the grid, uh, which I stated earlier, but there was also um, the, the act of drawing, right? I mean, it's this very disciplined, controlled uh, movement. Um, and all the, a lot of the times, uh, like if we look at this kind of river, it, it, I, I, there's a lot of control that I still had but um, 
I'm still moving with the natural anatomy that my arm has. Drawing a grid really pushes up against that. It, it conflicts against that. Um, so as a practice, um, you know, and, and this was um, me as a student looking at her work uh, in undergraduate school, it is not, this wasn't something that I necessarily wanted to emulate, but I understood what she was trying to do with the hand and how, how that control or how you can use that control. With, with Murakami, um, there was this, well, there's this immediate connection to pop, popular culture um, that I don't have <laughs> in a sense. But um, the, if I use uh, cartography as a basic framework structure um, and the content that I have could be anything, then I can employ color schemes that may relate to popular culture. Um, in the same way that Murakami does. And, and in fact, that's what I'm doing a lot now in my work um, right now, um, uh, that uh, I'm taking a visual, I'm combining visual languages from co popular culture or from really anywhere that I could find some reason to use them and combining them with cartography in a sense to um, uh, point more to the visual language rather than to the uh, cartographic content that may exist there. Um, so those, um, th that would be a really fast way to say how Murakami and Martin are influential. Actually, could you? Yeah, yeah, no, no, let's let's hear you I'll pick up another one, which is Gerhard Richter, who might be interesting to you, yes? And one of the reasons that Gerhard Richter um, is attractive is that I think he gave a lot of artists permission to work in so many different ways, which is something we were talking yeah. about earlier. Well, for sure, yes. Um, Gerhard Richter, and um, I don't know if people would pick up on it so much with my work, except for the shadowy aspects, but I'm a huge fan of Joseph Cornell, and um, I, I've always been intrigued. I, ha I have a bunch of three-dimensional work as well, which is could be more closely associated with him, but I was really drawn to the mystery and surrealism of, of the possibilities of what I was doing here with this work, and and uh, um, and yet there was a kind of drama. I, I think I, I'm sort of uh, naturally wanting to push the envelope with with my work, and uh, so I, I and so uh, a kind of that celestial <laughs> sort of mysterious darkness um, plays into it in the same way that I think. I, I um, worked in a gallery in New York in the 80s, um, a very high profile gallery, and I handled a lot of his work, so I got to see a lot of it up close and personal, as well as Agnes Martin. Um, of Cornell's yeah. work? I'm sorry? Of whose work? Joseph Cornell's of work, Cornell's and um, I was, I felt like um, I had kind of died and gone to heaven. Mm -hmm. uh, even though I don't really believe in heaven, I just like, I, I felt like I was there and it was uh, an amazing experience and it has been with me ever since, so. Okay. Um, so Agnes Martin, <laughs> for me. <laughs> well, it was definitely love at first sight, um, but the qualities that I appreciated in her work was actually, um, I, I, very early on, I saw a, a documentary about her and how she makes her work and how she's so present in, um, in the, the studio space. And sometimes the straight mark, she's actually using you know, her hand to, to make the grid. And how her work is at once flat, but it also carries this infinite depth. And how, how at once it's, it has borders and it also like extends to um, you know, a, enormous distances. So that's where that kind of association and that kind of love that I developed for Agnes Martin. Another um, artist is Julie Mehratu. And I loved her work because um, how she used the form of language to, um, to get to the pieces that at once it was chaotic but also orderly. And for me, it kind of re reminded me of a battlefield. And I really like that, um, like that association in her work and, and, and some of my pieces that, that we don't see here, perhaps a little bit, 
carries that same methodology of looking or methodology of entering the work where it wants it's sort of grid-like and, and connected to be um, logical. And then the other, and other points is, is chaotic. It's almost like a battlefield. Um, it's, it's some sort of memento mori, contemporary memento mori for me. I hope you don't mind. I, I just want to add something. Um, it, it's an anecdote, though. It's, yeah. I'm not adding anything contentional to this. <laughs> uh, I met Agnes Martin when I was in high school. Yeah, I, I, she had a show at the Contemporary Arts Museum in Houston, and at the time she was in a wheelchair. And um, so I, I met her, I was in um, 10th grade, um, and um, uh, she was, the thing I remember was that she had this really great brooch on her, and then she stood up and shook my hand, because she, she, you know, she was excited to see a young <laughs> artist <laughs> that was in high school that wanted to be an artist. So, yeah, just, famously reclusive. Yeah, yeah. 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 Little left. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Yeah. That's thrilling. Um, so, we're talking a lot about process, and um, I, I'm wondering how the um, this physical object that you're making, that you that you have, how that is or is not a corollary to your conceptual content for what you're doing, and how they relate to each other. Anyone want to start on that? I have something that I'm thinking about, so I can. Yeah. Can they choose that question? Obviously, it's a bit of a doozy. The, the, the question was they're, they're making things that are very physical and they're very involved with process, and particularly Indira is talking about process. and, and they all are cutting. And so I was interested in, in, in having some sense from them of how, whether that physical object becomes some kind of corollary for the whole conceptual process that they're going through, how closely they relate to each other, how important that might be or not be, whether those are two separate things, one is simply a byproduct, or whether it's, they're integrated and somehow it's an integral aspect the actual physicality and, and process of making those objects. Yeah, I mean, for me, that physical object is extremely important and it has to work. I have a lot of failures in this Measure of Art series. And so it's a dialogue with my ideas, putting them into this physical object, seeing if it is holding or not, and then moving forward and back and forth. But the physical object is incredibly important. It also takes me to the next level. It's you know, back and forth, what's in my head, what's out there on the canvas, on the sheet of paper, and so on. Yeah, I, am, I have a similar experience. Um, I, I feel like working in series is essentially just a, a, descript, a, a description for one thing leading to another <laughs> for me. Um, I, I, I don't really uh, have a very rigid process. It's very organic and um, these things uh, definitely are a reflection I've come to realize of uh, my life, uh, where I am in my life at any given moment, I think. Uh, the, uh, I, I had a solo show um, back in 2014 in the city and in San Francisco, and I, I really was struggling with a concept for this show, and I uh, ended up traveling quite a bit before the show came together and uh, yeah I realized through that travel that um, away from the studio away from the process of making this work that it was uh, a lot about the what was happening in my life there were all the I was leaving a 25 year day job my mother died I had serial converted to HIV it was just like it was a hugely like tumultuous time and I couldn't there was I was looking for a single conceptual idea or word to describe what was happening to me because I realized that this is uh, what was what it was this it was manifesting through this work and I called the show untethered and it was quite literally that it was all it was like this pulling apart this, this kind of stringy uh, nature of what was happening in my world so yeah that that's a very real question for <laughs> Thank you for asking. 
So I, I think it, for me, it's like the question of chicken or the egg, you know, what comes first. Um, but if I have to pick one, I would say the concept comes first because I think since I also work in series, I always think about, okay, so I'm really fascinating with, you know, this idea or this question. And then I try to figure out what will be a visual um, um, vocabulary for that. And then I try to focus on like the small details of that. It's like, okay, well, let me just focus on this and let's see if I can get that vocabulary going on. But really, throughout the process, throughout the making, you, you have to go back and forth. I mean, you can't be always focusing on like, but what does it mean? You know, you really are engaged <coughs> with, with, with how the work is, is coming along as a physical object. So going back and forth, it's, for me, it's, it's incredibly valuable. And sometimes I do things that are not related conceptually, that at that time I really wanted to, to see how something turns out visually, how the certain process would actually give me a new um, entryway to something that I'm interested in. But a lot of reading also influenced my, influence my work. And I don't know if it's coming out, but it is influences me as a person. Um. You know, a lot of the questions that you're asking are very, um, really good foundational questions in, in terms of our practices. Um, so I hope you don't mind me couching my answer um, in my undergraduate experiences, uh, because this is when I first started this work. And it was very, it's very frustrating that this, your, this particular question was never asked to me when I was in undergraduate school. Because you would think that, why are you making it on paper with markers would be an important question, but apparently it wasn't. Because when I was in undergraduate school, there was this, um, and this was in the 90s, uh, so there was this, at the time, there was this resurrection of painting, especially in New York at the time, um, with artists like Alexis Rockman and, um, and uh, Walton, uh, yeah, Walton Ford, or, no, no, never mind. Alexis Rockman is the only one I'm thinking of right now. But um, there was this pushed by a lot of my professors, um, why am I not painting these? Because there is a very strong abstract, ab abstractive quality about these that um, would look great as a painting. Um, and yeah, fine, they probably would. I'm a horrible painter, and when I paint, I'm not really painting, I'm drawing with the paint, so there's a very big difference. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I understand um, stood from the very beginning that the kind of material that I'm going to be working on would be just as important as the kind of content that I'm trying to work with or a concept. Um, so I, I, I stated a little bit about this before, um, uh, this conflict between having the hand-drawn map and um, showing some sort of accuracy um, or perceived accuracy associated with the map um, and correlating that with um, um, older cartographic practices of ha the hand-drawn map and um, replacing um, inaccurate or un um, unmasked information with made-up um, uh, visuals, and which is basically the same thing that I'm doing except in a slightly skewed version. So having the works on paper um, with a somewhat contemporary medium like um, you know, these alcohol-based inks um, and these graphic design, graphic design markers um, were really important. Now the question is having to find the right combination of paper and marker um, or kind of ink because if any of you have ever had to, um, you know, color large swaths of um, area with a, a, a marker, you're going to get these strokes um, and you don't get a very nice flat surface. So it took a while until I found a nice combination between um, this particular paper, which is uh, Stonehenge. Um, the, the paper from these four, that, no, that was Stonehenge too. All of these are Stonehenge, which is a very general uh, printmaking paper. Um, and it, it doesn't, um, doesn't yellow, um, it's acid free. So it should be able to last for quite a while. Although I am hoping for a little bit of a nice brown tinge to them. <laughs> in a good sensory or so <laughs> to emulate more of the map. It is yeah. the map after yeah. all. <laughs> Singe the edges. I know yeah. you have to the edges. <laughs> <laughs> but, but, but that's a very important fundamental question, though, is, is the medium that we decide to choose. Um, because it's, it's the way our 
uh, uh, visual languages are executed. So it's very important that um, there is a correlation between the two. So um, I thought maybe we could open up to questions from those who might have been waiting. Yes? I'm interested in what your relationship is with color and the relationship of using color in your work. Just very broadly, you can answer it any way. Um, the, the, the markers that I use are um, uh, the Pantone markers, or originally were Pantone and now they're Copic. And so if you're not, if I'm not mixing colors, that means I have a very limited color palette of about 306 colors. Um, and um, that really requires some very creative combinations of colors to be able to not be repetitive, because it's very easy to become very repetitive with my colors. Um, so. Um, I think um, that would be one of my biggest challenges. What, one of the things that's happening right now is that I'm involving a lot of digital processes in my work, so now there's an infinite amount of colors, um, which really pushed to question my own color theory, because uh, I think I'm, when I start having an unlimited amount of color, I think my visuals are all off <laughs> compared to the 306 colors that I originally had to work with. Um, but now I'm, I'm Instead of just dealing with the, those, um, that particular set of colors, um, I'm, appro I'm appropriating colors on a very intentional level, um, in, in a very intentional way. Um, so if I'm bringing in a very particular red, it's coming from a very particular source. So for me, um, it was important that I use um, a humble medium such as um, graphite and mainly just gesso, which is sort of like the basic um, and then I use white ink occasionally, and sometimes I use the white china marker. And I'm purposefully staying away from the color to sort of be on the opposite side of, um, you know, overwhelming, overstimulating kind of screens and, and things like that. So for me, it's, it sensitizes my understanding of value. And um, also, pay, for me, it was important that we pay attention what's there and not really be um, taken away by um, excess of color. So that's why I stay away for this project from color. <laughs> OK. In a measure of art, I am taking the palette from the artist in question, although sometimes I'm using color to represent data. So in this piece here, based on um, Eva Hesse, if you look at the legend on the bottom right, the colors um, indicate the medium that she's using, and then the data is coded by those um, other colored, other than the dominant color pattern, when you have a different color going on, it's coding the data, and it's also telling you an additional bit of information is what medium she used for the piece that was sold. So. I love that. There's also a color relationship to the history, the art history involved in all your work. Mm -hmm. You know, the fact like you know, these are <laughs> colorful characters. Yeah. Um, <laughs> um, I, um, I, I feel like I'm uh, um, <clears throat> giving too much information about my past, but uh, I was a decorative painter as well for many years. And um, I, uh, if you know anything about decorative painting, there's a lot of um, color matching involved. And uh, I, I've taken a lot of cues from uh, whatever paint I've applied to my collages, collage work or my painting work, have, have been largely informed by what's in the printed, an, an extension of the printed matter. And, um, but by the same token, I've, I've, I've taken that idea and sort of flipped it and sort of tried to, uh, in some cases, add completely alternate realities to, of color to um, those scenes like as well. Those three, like those three, uh, these are Lordy's. Oh, I'm yeah, sorry. Yeah, I'm these sorry. Are, yeah, yeah. Okay. And, um, but. The two. the two. Yeah, I mean, for by and large, I think this work tends to represent what feels like a, a more continuity of color to the map itself. But um, in many cases, uh, when you come to my studio, you see a little wider variety of that. So. I just want to add something yes. to, to color. Um, uh, you know, with uh, same thing with um, the uh, map language, I, I find color to be very um, uh, relative in the way we perceive it. So obviously, you know, we all see the same colors very differently. 
depending on our um, anatomy. But um, with these small drawings, when I'm having to install, you know, a um, hundred or so of them, um, the surrounding colors um, can influence the colors that are um, around some one, one, one drawing. So if I have a drawing that has a lot of orange in it and I surround it um, by a lot of other drawings that are somewhat brown, then that orange has a tendency to become brown to us. Um, and because of that um, uh, relativity in it, uh, that relative quality, it, it means that I can change the content or the meaning of that color in the same way that I'm changing the content and the meaning of the map. So there's this uh, parallel that I get to play with. Um, so um, it, it has a great quality um, that um, it becomes a fundamental investigation in my work in the same way with cartography. Yes, probably that more than anything in this show. Uh, that piece is is particularly yes. Um, <laughs> I, I I I would love to have been a you know for uh, had a conversation with him. <laughs> and in a way, that's that is my conversation with him. So. Oh yeah, yeah. No, I I pull back the curtain all the time with my work. I don't, I, 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 it's uh, yeah. I those are layers of Optium acrylic um, with maps attached at different layers, and in some cases there's mylar layers in between the Optium that uh, have paint gouache moves particularly on them. And uh, in that case, there's a mirror in the in the very farthest background. So I wanted to create that kind of. Um, a, a feeling of icy reflection um, in that in that sort of void um, behind uh, whatever you could actually see through there. Um, I, I'm actually starting another series very similar to those, um, so uh, stay tuned. <laughs> No more questions from the audience. I have, I have one that, I mean, since you're pulling back all the <laughs> <laughs> curtains here and we're, and we're looking. So here's the question, and that is, um, you, you, your work, does your approach to organizing space and information, um, does this reflect how you are in your lives? It's, a, it's pretty much my truest self. <laughs> Yeah, for me, I'm back and forth. I mean, I have this tendency, I can be very, very organized, and I can do math, and I can do all of these things, but there's a part of me that doesn't enjoy that. I mean, it's, it's like the whole business side of it. On the one hand, it was um, a way to set myself up as something in opposition to business, yet it, through doing this, I've become more interested in business and in markets, so, so I, I go back and forth. So I, I guess being an educator myself, I, and, and the question that I often ask to my students is like, how is your work relevant to, you know, the, to this moment that we're, we're living in? And, and, and perhaps this is where, where my work comes in. It's like I want to ask myself um, that question. How is this relevant and how is my um, time investment actually um, worth for others to be engaged with? And um, my life is not as orderly as, as it might appear here. <laughs> but I do very, very, very much appreciate um, a studio time. It really offers the um, enormous sense of um, understanding what one of the most beautiful things about humans are, you know, which is our creativity and our understanding of each other and how can we actually um, essentialize ourselves and our own being and therefore connect um, with, with others. So that's what the most rewarding thing about being an artist and making art. Yeah, you know, I couldn't agree with you more, Indira, um, because there, there, I hope I don't offend anyone. There's no utility to art, 
whatsoever, in my opinion. There's no utility. But we continue to do it as a species. We continue to make art. I mean, of course, there's, um, there's an economic reason for it now. But um, as, a, you know, as a utility driven species, right, um, there's no reason for making this. Um, and yet, it's probably the most human thing that we can do. Um, you know, drawing in itself is just an innate thing that I think humans are not necessarily good or bad at it, it's just a way of expression. And so there's something quite beautiful about that. Um, but, what was the question again? Why do we make it? Or, <laughs> <laughs> or influence, influence, or, influence or, yeah, that's, that's where I was trying to get to. <laughs> Uh, before, the whole reason why I started this work was, because, like I said before, was a sense of homesickness and always looking at the map. But nowadays, I don't look at the map anymore. Um, I, I mean, I look at the map every day because of on my phone, but the act of, you know, unrolling a map or unfolding it, doing that, that doesn't exist for me, and I'm assuming for a lot of people. Um, so that that part of that um, that activity is gone now. So. I find myself in a really strange place in my work where now I find my interest lies in all of these other things that aren't related to maps. And yet there is a fundamental conceptual thread that I can connect all of these interests that I have together. For example, fake news. Um, you know, I'm sure we, we've all been watching, um, yeah. Um, and where fake news comes in, and there is this um, expectation from uh, of the media to uh, to tell the truth in a way, in the same way that we expect maps to tell the truth. Um, the question is: Is what do we expect artists um, to portray? Are we truth tellers? Are we interpreters? Um, what is our? And I think a lot of artists are kind of dealing with this now: Is what of our? What is our place? Um, in society at the precipice of wherever we may end up. Um, so in terms of what's going on, yeah. Um, but visually, um, perhaps not, but it always, everything always finds a way into your work as an artist, no matter what you're doing, as long as you continue to make art. I think maybe we'll end here and um, say thank you very much for sharing this wonderful work with us and your, um, your ideas and inspirations and perspectives. And it has enriched us all today. Thank you so much. And thank you all for being here with us. Thank you. Thank you.